Welcome to Hawkett Podcast. Our guest today is Hawk Dog, an aircraft recovery mechanic and a father. How's it going, Hawk Dog? Good, good. Doing well, Amit. Thanks for having me on. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. So what you been up to lately, man? Man, I've been pretty busy since uh, since spring started, man. I, we even had a plane go down today that everyone was just like, no, it's we're all busy. Could we please do it on Monday? Like one just went down in Larkspur down by Forest Mommy. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's been, it's been busy. The planes going down. We, you know, if, if it's an easy sit down, like they put it down and everyone's okay. Uh, we'll go out, we'll disassemble it, throw it on a trailer and either bring it back to the owners or if it's uh, like, like a, questionable circumstances it'll be disassembled and held in a hangar for the ntsb to search through and comb through various aspects of evidence to figure out why the pilot had to set it down mm -hmm. so hard like in, go ahead go ahead like intentional versus like unintentional landings to, to put it in layman's terms basically mm -hmm. so i yeah i was like i was like i I think I reached out to you three times. All those three times, you're like, I'm busy with work. I'm like, damn, you're busier than the president. Right, right. Yeah. You know, and I, that's really funny too, because I got, I mean, I got hired off this company. It'll be two years ago in, uh, in September. I mean, I just got hired on to be the, the mechanic to help take care of the trucks and trailers and general maintenance on the, on the equipment. And, you know, they're like, hey, every once in a while, can you go out on, recovery and you know i do and it's quite a learning experience every single one of them there's something out of left field that comes up that you have to think on the fly come up with a solution on site that kind of stuff you know here lately it's been fires we've been dealing with just weird fire stuff so we're hoping to get a a leash on that man i don't want anyone to catch on fire <laughs> So let's start with your background. Where are you from? Tell us your origin story. Well, I'm originally from Ohio. Uh, I was born in 1977 in Northwest Ohio, a little town called Bryan. Um, grew up there. Was just your like average kid into models, slot cars, radio control cars, dirt bikes, like hot rods, that kind of stuff. And, um, I dealt, I mean, there's a lot of stuff I dealt with as a kid, um, that a lot of people have it. Like I was, I grew up next to a swimming pool and, uh, like in the mid eighties, I mean, there's, there's still a problem with child predators out there. It just seems to be masked under, uh, I don't know, man. I don't even know how to word it anymore. It just seems like it's out in the open and everyone thinks it's okay to, go after kids but a lot of people are still in denial and this is an area of the country where they're still in like uber denial when it comes to uh children being targeted and, and molested and kidnapped and that kind of stuff i was taken by like a friend of the family camping for a weekend with just that just kind of turned into like a uh a, a, a nasty weekend that to mm -hmm. put it like nicely i guess for the podcast i don't, don't want to get too dirty on it but i mean a grown man basically had his his way with me in like 1989 when i was about 12 or 13 and now i'm 46 and i'm like wow you know like i'm glad i i, I stuck around for this life because i eventually you know became a dad and a husband and all that kind of stuff and you know statistically People like me don't don't hang around in life. They find a vice to hang on to until they're dead or or just, you know, decide they don't want to be around anymore because they feel like they've been targeted targeted by the darkest forms of humanity and want to check out. But, I mean, I my my old man checked out when I was about four years old. He had a traumatic brain injury, um, was deemed like mentally retarded, which like, I don't have a problem with, I've never had a problem with the word retard. I grew up with the word retard, man. My dad was like deemed retarded in like 1984 from his traumatic brain injury. And 
when I speak openly about it, people are offended. I'm like, wow, you're, you're offended that my dad was retarded when I was growing up. That's, that's really strange. Cause I'm the one who actually had to grow up with it. You know, people, people are, people are weird. People don't understand. I, I, I noticed something. People's problem is that they don't like listen to the person's story before making a judgment on about them. Right. Oh, for sure. I got that a lot. I mean, I, uh, I was bullied a lot uh in in middle school uh i was the kid with the coke bottle glasses obviously i got contacts in right now but i wasn't i mean i wasn't this big six three six four almost 200 pound dude i was a scared little boy growing up and i didn't even get away from that until i got out of my hometown like and i didn't even i couldn't even leave my hometown until i was about 21 because of my own like screw ups like i in order to deal with a lot of my trauma i drank until i blacked out and that started when i was like 14 15 and didn't end until my mid 20s you know what uh, let me ask a question was the drinking associated with your dad having the retardation problem like the no no that was just an escape for me to get away from uh my by being molested as a kid like my dad stuff was just dad stuff yeah i mean i grew up without a dad and it was sad man i hear i hear about some stories about kids who grew up with a dad and i'm like god that sounds like a nightmare you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so some of us you know and in, in some of us blue collar guys that are gen x that did grow up without dads we we found what we needed through like different interactions through adult males in our lives and took like the good the good pieces of that male and just like incorporated it into a male like we should be or or growing up like a lot of us grew up knowing like who we didn't want to be so mm-hmm. we put that down <laughs> mm-hmm. so now what was your favorite memory with your family like what was that one thing about your childhood that you really enjoyed with your family we would all go camping uh at a local lake I believe it was called Jellystone Park somewhere in Indiana. It's still there, but now it's like a like a water park campground and stuff. But my mom was a single mom. We had I got a brother and a sister, and I got another sister from my dad too. But uh, I mean, we grew up in a broken home, but my mom held it together as best she could, and she did. I mean, amazingly through the eighties and nineties, like working a factory job with three kids, she did it with a little bit of public assistance, I can only assume. I don't really talk to her about it that much, but I know she instilled my work ethic into me because she still got up and went to work every day, did the nine to five, made dinner, you know, took us on good vacations in the summer, camping, and, you know, always had a good Thanksgiving and a good Christmas for us. So, I mean, she did her best. God bless her for it. Mm-hmm. So as a child, what did you want to be when you were growing up? Um, well, I think I wanted to be like a race car driver or like a pilot. I, I wanted to be like a helicopter pilot, but I always got told because I wore glasses, I would never be a pilot or fly anything. But I think that was just like an 80s, like boomer cop out to like, oh, just forget about it, kid. So you can focus on real things in life, you know? But now they're all hurting for all those kind of people. So I'm like, oh, maybe I should have went after that. <laughs> well, if you, if you really think about it, now your job involves working with planes and rescuing planes. So it, you technically are like working in that like field, in, like the air. Yeah. Oh, yeah, field. for sure. Like it's weird how I ended up that way, like subliminally in life. Because I, um, my my first jobs were just like odd jobs, like. I think one of my first jobs in high school was just like washing dis- dishes at the China Garden restaurant in town. <laughs> and then did like how, landscaping. How were, those, how were those jobs in like when you were very young? I never, I never worked in my life because of my health issues. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, health. I never worked, so I just focused on school. And then this is technically my work. My podcasting is my job. It's become, right on. It's become a full time job now. So when you were going through all the first jobs you'd done, how was that? Like the dishwasher dishwasher job and anything else you did? Well, I just knew they were stepping stone jobs and not real. I didn't even know. I 
like my first career, I don't even know if I can call it a career. It was like my first real job was a, I was a commercial fisherman in Alaska. So like, and that was at, at, at 21. I mean, I, at 18, I like, I've got, I, I got to lead into this story, which kind of sets me up for like, like how my life ended up basically um, at 18 um, June of 1996. Like I, after my school, after my class graduated and we're all having fun, like I ran into the guy who molested me at my local Taco Bell. And like, we were just, my buddy and I were just out road, like road partying in the nineties and like Trans Am riding around with my T-tops out, just having a normal night. We go through this Taco Bell and who hands me my food, but the guy who molested me as a kid, he's back out of the Navy and, 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 and like in public again, you know? And, uh, I was like, Oh God, what am I going to do? So I proceeded to just get absolutely smashed for about two weeks straight and got into like all my trouble where I grew up. Well, in, uh, in 1996, uh, state of Ohio, along with something to do with with the crime bill that that Biden wrote in '94, everything was being incorporated in '96 at the turn of the year. Well, ever since that crime bill, Ohio has like this magic felony law, and it's for failure to comply with a police officer's order or signal. Well, I was the first one in my county in Ohio would ever be charged with that. And um, I ended up being charged with it. I don't, I like, I've, I've been trying to get the records on this case for 25 years. They've ignored all my requests. Um, I can only assume because the, the whole thing was botched and I just ended up going, I tried to do probation for a year that didn't work. Um, so after a year, I, was like 20 years old. I'm like, look, man, I can't do four more years of probation. I'm 20 years old in Northwest Ohio. You got to be kidding me. Like you're, I'm going to be dealing with you guys for the next 10 years, not five if I stay here, you know? So I went to it after a year of being on probation for it. um, I went to prison in 1998 for six months just to get done with all of it and be released off probation. Well, the two courts didn't even work together. One court found me indigent and said, okay, you're obviously broke. You're a 20-year-old kid. Um, go to prison and do your time while well, I get out. And then the city court, the municipal court, refused to find me indigent and was like, oh, no, you still owe us money. and You owe us all this and that to like thousands and thousands of dollars. Well, so I get back out and they throw me on municipal probation until all my fines are paid. I'm like, okay, guys. So I get a little BS factory job all on me and I start paying on all these fines that they lump all bumped on me. Um, carry over. I turn 21, 1999. I go to Alaska for the first time. I come back with big dick fisherman money. And it was like, 14, six, like 14 to 18 grand. I can't remember the exact amount, but that was a lot of money in 1999. So mm-hmm. I walk into the uh, how, before, clerk of courts. What's that? Sorry. Right. Before you continue, how much money did you make as the fisherman? Um, well, I made, I can't remember if it was a 5% cut or a 10% cut of the ship's groves, but over the three years I was there, it went from about 20 grand to 15 grand down to about eight grand. And then I was like, okay, I got to find something else to do. This isn't worth sacrificing an entire summer to go make eight grand. I can, I can do that, you know, landscaping for a summer, you know, and, and not have to deal with the hassle of getting my butt up to Alaska every year to go fish. So, um, that was that, um, but yeah, when I got back from Alaska at 99, I walked into the clerk of courts. And I'm like, what's my tab? And they're like, it was something like $3,800 still. And I counted out, I counted out $3,800 in like 20s and slapped it on the counter. I'm like, are we done here? I'm like, I need to get out of the state before you guys have me here forever. And then I took off to like 
North Carolina and then ended up in uh, Colorado for like the year 2000 and then fished again. I lived in Cincinnati for a little while um, on my next gig because I traveled around the country a lot for automakers and debuted uh, automobiles for them. Um, while I was doing that, I had a disc out in my back, which was which is what kind of had me in Cincinnati for a while. I'm like, oh, I'm not going anywhere for a minute. And then uh, about 2006, I finally came back out to Colorado for good and settled down into my career as a mechanic and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So how long have you been doing uh, mechanic work for? Pro at least 20 years wow. now that I look back, yeah. We had a little hot rod shop in, in Cincinnati for a little while, and we maintained the guy's uh, like million dollar car collection for a little while. And that was fun. We were like early 20 year old kids, didn't even realize what we were doing or what we had. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, as a mechanic, what is the hardest equipment that you have you, that you ever had to repair? Um, snow cats. Like I was a ski resort mechanic for a few years early in my career. And those are a, a whole new beast. It's a huge diesel engine. It's a diesel over hydraulic system. So not only do you have to worry about the, the diesel engine aspect of it, you're monitoring hydraulic pressures and leaks and lines, and looking at the tracks, welding up cracks and browsers and all that kind of stuff. So. And you're also working up in anywhere from 30 degrees above zero to 50 degrees below zero. So every day you just, it's just a new challenge, was a new challenge on the mountain. Mm -hmm. So after your ski job, becoming doing that mechanic job, how did you get into aircraft recovery then? Well, after my ski job, I uh, ran my, I, I lived in, uh, the San Luis Valley of Colorado, Crestone. That's where the Love is One cult and all that stuff went down. I don't know mm -hmm. if you remember that. I've heard, about, I've heard about the cult before. I, yeah, was, there was, I was very young when that happened, but I've done research in the past few years about cults, and that's one that's come up. So I know what you're talking yeah. about. I've heard of the cult name before. We moved to Crestone the year after uh, a girl like disappeared, and then there was a huge podcast about it called Up and Vanished. And then, uh, like, systematically, everyone involved in that murder just like eventually overdosed and died. So it's like quite a coincidence, but not really. It's like, oh, I can see where this is going. So we lived there for about five years. I ran my own auto repair shop. Uh, in Crestone. Then COVID hit and everything just went belly up. Um, I went and worked at a local shop in like Alamosa for about six months and we sold our place, our, our house in Crestone and our land and uh, bought this house up in uh, up in Weld County and I just applied to this job and got hired and took off running with it really I, I really fit right in so now what are the common challenges that you face as an aircraft recovery person is it dealing with the people or is it just like hauling the the airplanes off of the ground and all that stuff well it's it's a little bit of both i mean not only are you dealing with a potentially like wrecked aircraft or like an accident situation you're you're kind of dealing with someone's baby. I mean, that's that's the epitome of of a pilot's hopes and dreams right there. And you know, they just set it down in an off off airport excursion. So you really just try to be as nice and compassionate as possible. I mean, I know like we're like the hard asses who come out to get the job done to pick up the plane and, and get it to storage, but you still really need to, you know, just just be nice to, to people because it's still a very traumatic situation, you know, and, you know, what, luckily for me, like I'm pretty much an empath. So when I show up, I'm just like, Oh man, I'm, I'm really sorry. Like I couldn't even imagine being in your shoes, you know, and, and just try to, there's no best of the situation. Someone just crashed their airplane. 
you know, the best you can do is just be there for them and let them know you're doing your best with with the situation. Mm-hmm. So how many aircrafts have you recovered throughout your career? Oh, man. At least, I want to say at least 15 to 20 in two years, yeah. So are they usually like like big planes, like commercial planes that you see in the sky, like? Um, I don't mean like airline not, planes. I mean like the. Sh- I've done some commercial, some some private jets. Uh, there was one that went down in uh, west Western Colorado, the Eastern Utah line, and it was it was a bad one. It was just there to clean up and, and get back. It was uh, like a Hawker eight hundred, which is a private jet. And then there was one that like slid off the runway up in Montana. Then we went up and brought back. We ended up putting that on like a semi trailer, though we didn't use any of our trucks to bring it back. Mm-hmm. So, now, um, what's I gonna say? I blanked out. So, when you're like, do you only just work in Colorado or do they make you go up? Other- we go all over the country. Our our parent company, um, is a is a we they buy and sell a lot of aircraft and aircraft parts. So, if it's a slow like a slow, I don't want to say week or whatever, but we have a whole nother division that's looking at parts and stuff to buy all over the country. And if they find something, we'll go pick it up and bring it back and see what's good, see what's bad and put it back into, into the like airworthy rotation, so to speak. Mm. So now describe your job. Uh, what do you, what do you like, what do you do for like nine to five? Like what is your, Job and well, if I'm at the shop, um, I'll, I'll get in about 7.30. Um, if I have a truck, I'll get it up on the rack. Um, I'll look it over, inspect the front end, inspect all the moving parts, um, ball joints, suspension components, like control arms, torque arms, and just to make sure everything's tight, no play, nothing broken. Uh, make sure there's no hip holes in airbags, that kind of stuff. Um, change oil, change filters. Do a, a system diagnostics with my scanner to see if there were any hiccups on the last few hauls, that kind of stuff. What else? Anything else you do? Um, trailers. I'll look over trailers. Uh, make sure they're up to date. I do a lot of the registration stuff. A lot of the admin stuff to make sure everything's all up and up as far as uh, DOT inspections and licensing and all that stuff. I'll go to the DMV and get all the all the registrations, and plates taken care of, title work done. Um, as far as trailers, I inspect the wheel bearings uh, for play. I'll re-grease them. I'll check the brakes for wear to make sure they're not under spec, so we're not a danger to anyone out on the highway and all our stuff is up to snuff. I always make sure my guys are safe out there on the road. And everyone gets back. Okay. So now what is the most challenging part of your job? The unknowns. There's always so many unknowns. Like when we go out to grab a plane or just anything from left field, some of these new trucks I take care of, they see an electrical glitch and they want to, shut down until they're towed to a dealership and get diagnosed and repaired sometimes. Mm-hmm. Now, how do you handle failure or setbacks in your work? Well, you just, you just kind of take them as they come and roll with the punches and try to find the best solution possible. Mm-hmm. So besides what else do you do? Do you do anything else besides taking Planes from crash sites and mechanic work. Is there anything else you do with that job? Um, I mean, that pretty much sums it up. Other than, I mean, just taking care of the day-to-day stuff at work, which entails fixing and repairing stuff on the daily operations of what we do over the road anyway. Mm -hmm. Has has there been ever a time when you had a plane behind the truck in the um whatever you call it has it ever come loose and fallen off it hasn't fallen off but we've had we've had some straps come loose to where we've had to pull over on the highway and restrap the load just to make sure it's safe 
because we don't want anything flying off into traffic or anything like that. I mean, our names are all over our trucks. We don't, we generally don't want to look bad out there. So we want to, we try to stay ahead of it, make sure our loads are secure before we roll. But man, the roads are, have been getting so bad lately. Like, some of these potholes, man, like you hit one, you're like, oh man, I gotta pull over and check my load. That thing rocked the fillings out of my teeth. Like, holy cow. Mm -hmm. Now, if you could change one thing about your job or workplace, what would that be and why? Um, I don't know. Maybe I'd really like to just have less planes go down just to take the like human like aspect out of it so we could just go get i don't know maybe uh just have them be regular parts run instead of it be like you know a plane going down potentially someone's injured or you know fate fatality happens or that kind of stuff mm -hmm. now what was your most embarrassed embarrassing moment at work Do you have any um Sometimes when you're lifting stuff, stuff will fall and you don't expect it. And that's honestly pretty embarrassing. Um, we were just cleaning up a site last week and, you know, we were told that the site was clear and we were good to cut. So we went to cut and the byproduct of that cutting was like a, a flash flame fire from Avgas, which is has a very low ignite, like a spark will ignite Avgas because it's such high octane. So we had a fire start. That's just like no, we don't want that to happen ever. This fire's pretty, you know, scary. We can get out of hand very fast. Mm -hmm. So now moving away from your job, now what was one topic or event that made you question the world you live in? Oh, a lot of things, but. When it, when it, nothing really surprises me when it comes to world events, but just like when it comes to like just life events, like when my dad was taken away from me, that was pretty, pretty traumatic for me. And that makes me question a lot of things. Um, really, like not human nature wise, but just like life wise and like. Like, if there's a God, why why would a God allow stuff like this to happen in life? You know, we see many tragedies every day, and everyone's like, oh, you know, the Lord works in mysterious ways. Well, I'm like, oh, really? Well, that's awfully mysterious, you know, especially in the world we live in now. It's like, wow, we're just, you know, that old figure of speech going to hell in a handbasket. Like, it just seems like we're living it right now. It's like a, it's just this. I feel like we're living in a daily freak show. I agree. And if it wasn't, Sorry. and if it's, and it, it's, it's just like, it must, it has to be a simulation at this point, but it's not because like, I can't, I can't even wrap my, like my, my normal brain around it, but it's like, what's even normal anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. So now what is your opinion on our government? Cause I know you're very vocal on Twitter about that. And I'm what's that? I say, what's your opinion on the government? Because I know you're very vocal on Twitter. Oh, I think the government it, it just has too much overreach now. And, you know, and and they they don't. I, it's just like I said, it's just like it's like the freak show. It's like they, it's like we're all celebrating the freak show right now. And, and the common man who's, who's working common man, I mean, man, man, human, woman, and man, you know, the common sexes, the men and women are just cast off to the side right now. It's just a spotlight on the freak show. And it's just like, wow, you know, especially Gen Xers. I mean, we're like, wow, you know, we've, we waited all our lives to swim into the adult end of the pool. And it's just, it's a cesspool. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. definitely is so now if you could choose any movies or shows in any genre what would those be and why uh, 
I really, it's funny to me. I, I was just getting nostalgic the other day. I kind of like the seventies, the shows out of the seventies, like the late seventies, the Muppet show. Like I like that for the, like the old pop culture show. I thought that was pretty decent. I sat down and started revisiting that this weekend just to, just to see if I remembered it. Cause I don't, I don't remember a lot of my childhood. Well, some of it I do, but mm. some of it I've blacked out. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What other shows have you, did you go back to watching? Um, see, I, I, I dug on that 70s show when it came out. I always thought that was funny. Um, the Wonder Years, I grew up watching that a lot. And The Simpsons, of course. Um, I never got into like the Family Guy. Um, I watched South Park a lot before I had kids. It's like, once you have kids, you just kind of clock out from pop culture until they're 18. And then, you know, they're teenagers and they're in and out of their pop culture, but you don't really pay attention to that because it's just teenage pop culture at that point. So, I mean, now that my oldest is 18, I've kind of dipped my my head back into pop culture. I'm just like, oh, wow, what a mess we've created. <laughs> yeah, I can't watch anything anymore. I don't have any kids. I'm not a father, but I can watch. I cannot watch TV anymore. It just I've lost interest in it. The only thing I watch is YouTube or listen to audiobooks or read books. That's the only thing I do. Right. Do. Like my my wife keeps me up to date on some stuff. Like we were, I just watched like uh, This Is Us with her up until they got to like the COVID and, and BLM episodes. I was like, oh wow, they. They actually did jump the shark on this one. No wonder it got canceled. But then they backtracked and like, oh no, we we wrote it this way. We wrote it to get to get canceled. I'm like, yeah, sure you did. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, I could, yeah, the TV shows that they have now, I feel like are just recycled from the 70s or 80s or 90s, and they're bringing back again. Well, and they they gaslight a lot of nostalgia too. Mm-hmm. Like they try to get you to remember stuff way 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 better than it was which is crazy i yeah i'm like i'm not backing that up at all i mean i'll remember i don't remember the 90s that well but i like i don't need to know know it that well i like to just not care about it anymore because i watched all there was a lot of trash culture in the 90s dude a lot of people grew up thinking they were gonna be like millionaire drug dealers or we're going to sell drugs until they got rich and then do something else. And a lot of those people are the people who like overdose during the opiate pandemic. And it's just, or epidemic, I guess it wasn't a pandemic, but I don't know, man. I'm, I'm, I went through a couple back surgeries and, and the whole opiate thing. Like I'm, I'm the wrong person to talk to when it comes to, to the opiate stuff, man. Cause I'm, I, I, I guess I'm just an old hard ass when it comes to that stuff. Cause I mean, of course you want to hang on and keep having fun and keep the party going, so to speak, but man, you gotta, you gotta wean yourself off the drugs sooner or later and be a person before you die or become a monster, man. I mean, I understand mm-hmm. everyone wants to keep the party going, but people are like, Oh, well, you don't understand addiction. If you just think it's a party. I'm like, no, dude, I lived it. You know, I, I, I wanted to be fucked up every day like it was a party. I get it. But you got to put your big boy pants on or your big boy, big girl pants on and, you know, get back into society or you're just going to be a, a a zombie, you know. And I see the zombies all over, you know. I get it. Just like I said, like I, I'm an empath. I get it. I understand that you want to lay around all day and feel gravy in your veins and do nothing. I did that for a couple of years with a broken back. I get it, but you got to have that drive in you to want to be a better person and want to contribute to society. That's, I, I don't know how I ended up that person. I think I, I probably should thank my mom and my brother for it. Cause those are the only two people that instilled a, a work ethic into my life. You know, my brother's the one who got me, hooked up in Alaska. I mean, I had to show up and do the work, obviously, or my ass was off the boat. And I, I did it until it wasn't profitable. And I had to find something else, you know, to profit from. It's a capitalist society. You know, we got to figure out how to make a buck every day, or you're just a 
a loser, I guess. I don't know. I mean, I mean, we're not even allowed to say the word loser anymore. If it, There's if a lot of work we're not allowed yeah, to say anymore because people get offended. It's just crazy, dude. It's like, you know, if, if in my day, if you wanted to grow up and do nothing, you were a loser. I mean, even 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 the even the, the losers I grew up with knew they had to like sell drugs to do drugs. Like at least they had that instilled in them. I mean, not all of them made it because they were idiots, but that's that's Gen X, dude. It was sink or swim. Some people made it, some kids ended up on unsolved mysteries, dude. You know, that, that was growing up in the eighties and nineties. Did you ever watch any true crime? Were you into that kind of any of the genre shows? Um, what did I watch? Um, the one where it was about the FBI. Mind hunters. Um, Mind hunters. Yeah, I liked that. One. I thought that I'm was really still good. mad they didn't have a third season for that show. Me too. That was really good. I really liked Southland too when that came out. I don't know if you remember that one or not. No, I've never heard of that show before. But and going back to Mind Hunters, I'm still mad they didn't make a third season because. That cast they had did a perfect job for the roles that they yeah. got. Yeah, yeah, that was a great cast. I liked that a lot. Mm-hmm. And then I watched the. You know what really shocked me? What I I I still leaves me speechless is is watching like the 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 recent HBO documentary on on Timothy McVeigh and the whole domino effect of what. Ronald Reagan did in the early 80s did to set up like the whole white supremacist terrorist organization in our country like that was all because Ronald Reagan didn't bail out family farm and gave uh like 3 million uh, like illegals like instant uh immune not immunity but uh I can't remember what they called it. Amnesty. Yeah. Yeah. Like amnesty. And they all got citizenship. And then he left like the Southern border wide open. Like Ronald Reagan was like, Biden is doing the exact same thing. I know. And it's just, it's, it's on repeat. And, and they, they, our government just plays us like a fiddle and, and they, they think you're dumber than the dumbest person that you can come up with. Like if you if think of the dumbest person that comes to your mind right now, the government thinks you're dumber than that person. It's, it's crazy. If people are like honestly need to like stop worshiping, worshiping like Trump and all these politicians, even if it's Libertarian Party, right, left, center, it doesn't matter. They're all they're not going to help you out in the long run. They all offer you. No, money power. they don't. They don't care about us ants. We're not we're we're not donating, you know, six figures to their super PACs, you know. We're just the people that they get to pull out of the tax pool from. They don't care about us. They just want a third of our income. Mm-hmm. And it's sad. It is. <laughs> it is definitely sad. And another thing I've noticed is all these like latest stories I've been hearing on the news, like, oh, this politician got arrested or like got in trouble in the Supreme Court or something like that. There's a story like last week. I don't remember who it was. It was on Twitter. I was like, yeah, they're not going to do anything about it. They're not going to. No, it's like high school, uncle. man. It's like high school and they're all uh, student council. <laughs> That's all it is. It's just like Harry Potter. If you really <laughs> think about it, they have a high court in Harry Potter who does, yep. will do nothing to like the other side. Just let them go. Yeah, I just. I can't wrap my head around it. And then, you know, you try to pick the the party in between the two, which is the Libertarian Party. And they've, they just Dylan Mulvaney, the freaking Libertarian Party, and nominated Chase Oliver. Like, oh, thanks, man. Like, we're, we're trying to be like the halfway, like, normal. I don't want to say normal. Like, we're not normal because we don't really belong to a party, but... I'd like to feel like more blue collar Americans would identify as libertarian, not Republican for crying out loud. Like I, I think of both Democrats and Republicans. And I just think of someone sitting in the background, like, Oh, govern me harder, daddy. What am I allowed to do today? Like, come on, man. Like 
we, we were once a free country. We didn't used to have to ask permission for much, you know, and now everything is is punishable by fine. It just means legal for a fee. Like, give me a break, man. Mm -hmm. Well, not even politicians. A lot of, like, religious people, they totally worship, like, who... I'm not talking about Christians. Hinduism is the same thing. People go to, they, we call them pundits, which is just like a priest in Christianity. They go to them like for everything. Uh, people think for a damn self. If it's the right, wrong, right, right or wrong thing to do with your life, they go to them for every small thing. They're like, wow, you guys are crazy in the head somewhere. Right. Like, oh, let me pray on it. It's like, well, buddy, like, I've prayed to God numerous times, been near death. Like, yeah, I, I died on the table in a surgery. And you know what appeared to me? It wasn't God. It was my dead relatives asking me, what, what are you doing here? He's not supposed to be here yet. He hasn't even raised his kids. That was in August of 2005. You know, I'm thinking, I was thinking it was doctors standing over me trying to save me. And, and I'm like, oh, no. I'm like... It, it, it was my dead relatives telling me I wasn't supposed to be here yet. You're on the wrong timeline. And I'm like, what is this? No one said anything like this. <laughs> what was what was your near death experience about? Was it the back surgery or was it something truly really different? Yeah, um, it was my second back surgery in uh, it was like August 28th or 29th of 2005. And uh, pre pre op, the the nurse gave me too much morphine and. When they uh, put me under and tried to bring me back, it like messed up the the anesthesia and wouldn't allow me to come back. So they kept trying to save me on the table for about, I don't know, my ex said it was like three hours, but I have no idea of the timeline. It felt like it felt like a, a weekend me because I came to the next morning in the recovery room. And that's when uh, Katrina had hit. And the remnants of it were coming up through the Midwest. I thought I was waking up during the apocalypse. Like, I had no idea what was going on. But yeah, they gave me too much morphine. And it, I, I think it overdosed me through the surgery. And then I woke up in and out. And it was like, uh, it was like looking up from the bottom of a manhole cover and getting closer to it and then getting farther away from it. Like the light at the end of the tunnel. It was really weird. That's crazy. That's very crazy. So now, what genre of music do you enjoy listening to? I listen to damn near everything. But I really enjoy like 90s, like 90s rock and grunge. And a, like like house music, techno, that kind of stuff. I used to run around Detroit and the, like the electronic music festival and that kind of stuff in the early 2000s and late like 99s. So I, every spring I'd be out on tour doing stuff for Chrysler and then we'd be back by Memorial Day weekend for the electronic music festival. So we'd like get a hotel room and go downtown Detroit and have a good time and see all the DJs and whatnot. So what are some of your favorite bands or artists you listen to? Um, let's see here. There's a lot of them. Um, Probably my favorite band starting out was Soundgarden. And then uh, Pearl Jam, Nirvana. I used to play a lot of Nirvana, but then played it to death. Same with Green Day when they came out. Um, like Van Halen, that kind of stuff. Um, like Incubus. A lot of the old '90s rap, that kind of stuff. Like, I used to be in. I used to like Eminem, but then he just got weird. He got he. You know, it's weird how these guys rap about not selling out, and then they sell out, and then come back and try to rap like they're hard again. Like we didn't know that they sold out. It's like, no, cool man. You just keep being you, and make like. The music you were known for, please. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Because I like Adam Eminem just came out with their new, I think a new album or new song recently. I don't think yeah. it's interesting. I'm not a fan of his, but I noticed that he disappeared for like a couple of years. I don't know if I'm not a fan, like I said, but 
I don't know if he disappeared for a couple of years and has recently started to come back again in the in the limelight. I think that's interesting. Where were you? Where were you in those a couple of years? I see. I I only like his old stuff. Like when he did like that like Super Bowl Trump this stuff. I'm like, dude, what happened to Eminem? And why is there a dead raccoon on his face? Like, what what's he doing? Like, he looked like. Uh, he looked like he was trying to be someone from the Middle East. And I'm like, dude, what happened to Eminem? And he's like, is this like Jihad, uh, Slim Shady, or what, man? So now, what was your first ever concert you attended? Do you remember that? Um, It was a country uh, music artist named John Michael Montgomery at one of my local uh, Williams County fairs in like nine in the early nineties, like maybe 92, 91, something like that. And then after that, I don't think I went to any shows until I came out to Colorado and saw shows at Red Rocks and like Fiddler's Green. How are shows at Red Rocks? I've never been to Colorado. I've never seen, I've never gone to that venue before, but I've seen videos of people who've gone there. It looks very nice. It's really nice. Um, they've kind of turned it into a compound though. Like you get frisked as you come in and out of it. It's not like the happy go lucky concert venue. It used to be like, you know, they did this big anti-smoking, uh, cigarette campaign and it, you know, it's, they, I mean, they're patting people down at venues for cigarettes now to make sure they're not smoking cigarettes inside. It's just, it's really gotten strange. I almost feel like we're living in a a version of, of Judge Dredd that they didn't tell us about, you know? <laughs> yeah, I've noticed, yeah, I, well, people still smoke. I've gone to concerts and people still have the e-cigarettes. Somehow, some way they bring it inside and they still right, right. one out. Well, if they get busted, they'll throw you out. Like, it's, it's really nuts. And they've got, like, a curfew on the venue now. Like, you can't be allowed past 10 p.m. Because I, of all the, so, they do the Richies same. that moved in and built million-dollar McMansions all around the, the mountainside on the west side of town. Which isn't Denver. It's it's the golden area, actually. Like, like 10 miles, 15 miles west of the actual downtown of Denver. Like when I came out here 24 years ago, that was nothing but open space and trails. And now they've got. Can you imagine building a house for a couple million bucks and be, being able to open your bathroom window and touch your neighbor's house? Like that's how close they're building some of these places. Man. I have a couple of. I, there's a street like further down where I live. They have houses that are like this close to, uh, close to each other. So if you want to put like a ladder, you can cross to the other side of the house. That's how close apartment buildings right, are. Right, right. Like if the ground shifts, like these houses. places are going to lean into each other eventually. Like, it's really crazy. Yeah, yeah. So going back to the concert venues, yeah, I don't know what their new thing is now. They do the same thing here in LA. Like each concert needs to be over by 11 p.m. Some venues are right. 11 and some don't have it until like 12 midnight. It's like, what is this? Like, I thought venues back in the day used to go like 1, 2 p.m. Oh, they PM. did. Like, it used to be a good time, and now they've got everything reeled in. That's that's crazy. So now, did you grow up a sports fan, or did you play any sports when you were young? Um, I, you know, I played baseball a lot and loved baseball. And then once, <laughs> once 1989 hit, boy, I was pretty much nothing but a misfit after that, and Like... <laughs> I really was. I don't even know how I made it through through school or or high school because I was just a misfit. Like I had a problem with authority just just because of my trauma. It wasn't because I like hated the actual thought of authority. I was just like, whatever, dude. You want to try to tell me what to do? You have no idea what I've been through. Good luck with that. So, and it, I paid the price for it. I mean, I ended up going crazy and you know the only thing that saved my life was six months in a box going hey what what are you doing bro you're 20 years old are you going to cry about being molested forever or are you going to actually start your life here you know so 
I got out of prison in August 1998. I was like, okay, man, let's give this another try, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. So I know you're a Cincinnati uh, uh, fan. Yeah, yeah, I love Cincinnati baseball, man. I do, and the Cincinnati Bengals. It's like n- nothing will break your heart like being an Ohio sports fan, though. I tell you what. <laughs> well, I I live in LA, but I'm not any. I used to be a Lakers fan, but after the owner passed away, and then the daughter took over, and then the son took over, and I, I don't know who the hell is taking right. the team. It, they gone to like the trash bin, and I'm not a LeBron James fan at all. Don't care for right. him. Never did. He's a good player, but I don't like his personality. He has like a. I don't like attitude. his personality either. I understand he wanted a championship, but he could have. He could have gone about it a different way, but you know, we got a bad example. We had we had I, I had Jordan growing up, so we put Jordan on a pedestal. So we're we like, oh, Kobe you're Brian. not. I had Kobe you're not doing up. it like Jordan. You're a loser, you know, and that's how everyone sees it. And he's not Jordan. He's allowed to do it his way. And he's he, not a Kobe either. Because Kobe, was, he's 10 times better than LeBron. Right. And he sticked with one team for his all tenure with the Lakers. Yeah, he never he jumped around with any teams. Yep. And he never even thought about leaving LA. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was smart. Yeah, I, I grew up a Kobe fan. I went right. to a lot of Laker games when I was young. But That's awesome. Yeah, I get. I got to experience like the... Like that time, I also went to the game that when he, the eighty-one point game that he did with Toronto Raptors. Oh, okay. Yeah, I went to that game. I was way young when that happened. I probably was like twelve years old, so my memory of that has like gone away. I watched his last game. I remember watching his last game. I watched his last game. I also went to the. I don't know if you remember the game they did with the Phoenix Suns. I don't remember what year it was. It was the. If you saw the photo of Corey Bryant ripping his jersey and showing his like undershirt, right, right, I went to that game as well. Oh, right on. Yeah, I've seen. I've only been to Nuggets games. I've I've been to some Nuggets games. There, I mean, I can't believe they actually finally won a championship. But Denver's such a fly by night city. They they don't even celebrate their their winners here. Man, really? It really blows my mind. It's they, like, didn't do a, they didn't do a parade for the, well. They did a parade, but it's not. It's Denver's not the hometown it used to be, man. It's like it's been invaded. Like LA's been invaded over the years, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I never got. I went to Dodgers Dodgers games. Never cared for the Dodgers at all. Yeah, and the only time I go to Rockies games are when the Reds are in town, and I just. Go there to heckle Rockies fans. <laughs> Tell them Coors Field. I don't like, do that I'm like, opinion because I'm a Braves fan. And I don't oh, think a lot of Dodgers fans like the Braves. Yeah, because of like the whole like thing they had. Like, well, they didn't have like a controversy or anything, but it's like a competitive t- between those two teams. Yeah, the Braves were always good in the '90s, man. I remember always watching them and the Twins play and the division series with like John Smoltz and mm-hmm. oh, Maddie, the yeah. other guy Greg like Maddie. Randy Johnson. I can't remember who Randy Johnson. He was for the Mariners for a long time. Mariners. Then he went to Arizona Diamondbacks. I remember yep. him. I remember him during that time of the era when he was playing with them a little bit. So I right. think baseball fan <clears throat> around that time when all the good pitchers were in the league and all the best players. Right. Right. And now they have okay players. I don't even recognize half of them on as some of the teams. Only I know players on my teams because he talk about them. But any right. other uh, any other teams besides Aaron Judge from the Yankees, I don't know any other players from like. Yep, the, the only Reds. players I I know on other teams are old Reds. I'm like, oh yeah, he's an old Reds player. I remember didn't Joey Votto move from like not signed with the um Reds? And yeah, he, he went from the Reds to the Blue Jays. But I don't know if he's played yet for the Blue Jays. He was on injured reserve. Oh. But I don't know. A lot of people think Votto was overrated and the Reds paid too much for him versus what we got out of him. But, well, they, you know. The same was, thing happened with Albert Pujols when he went from after he got traded to the Angels. <laughs> he went down like bad. So I know. They did so much to bring like Ken Griffey Jr. home to the Reds too. And I'm like. Why didn't you go after him when he was hot? 
Like now he's just here retiring on cruise control. and We're just another small market team meandering our way through every season, you know, I but have, it was still uh, a blast. Yeah, I'm not an Angels fan, but I, I heard about the whole thing when they signed that huge deal with Al- Albert Pujols. I was like, you guys are kidding me, right? You, he's like, right. I think, I don't know how old he was, but like, you guys are going to regret it. And they did. Yep. Like and the, they're doing like the, the same Mets thing with, with Trout Bobby and, and they're doing the same thing with Trout and they show Itani completely left after yep. two years or yep. two years, more than I don't know how long he played for the, for the Angels, but yeah, you see what happened with him. He went to the, the rivals. Yep. It's crazy. I don't understand these baseball owners. They don't use their brains. Right. I know. Looks like the Rockies owners. The Monforts, like they they just want an entertainment team. Have you heard about Oakland? Uh, what's I know you're not an Oakland fan, but holy shit, that's bad. Well, I always remember Oakland because of Dennis Eckersley. Mm-hmm. They're like awesome pitch, pitcher that had all those saves, you know. And then we swept them in the you know the '90 World Series, which was like I'm like, oh, I'm really glad I was alive to see the Reds win. But it was like I was so young, I barely remember it, you know. Aren't they are they going to Vegas? Yep, they've already they they're having issues with financial financial backing, but they're gonna go. They're gonna figure out some way to get it from taxpayers in Oakland and they're gonna use that money to in Vegas with building the stadium. Now they're gonna go to uh, Sacramento for like four seasons. Oh wow. So I've been out I've done shows out in LA. Like I've been to the right by the Great Western Forum in Hollywood Park. I did a bunch of GM shows there. And then I've been down to like San Diego, down to Jack Murphy Stadium. I don't know what they call it anymore. It's always been Jack Murphy Stadium to me. But And then we I, we would do our San Francisco shows across the bay at Alameda Point, where they would do all the Mythbusters filming, like... It was cool. We were on the show doing these car shows. It was like being rock stars without a band. Man. We'd be on the on the road, 20, 40 people deep with like three, four semis full of show stuff, like full on display tents. Smaller than a circus, but it almost still looks like a circus, but it's all cars and coned off racetracks and like. Just a mess. You'd pull into a, an empty stadium parking lot, and in 48 hours, it would be a working show and event, basically. Mm-hmm. So now, do you like to read books or listen to audiobooks? I like to read. Have um, I, I haven't. I haven't listened to many audiobooks. If I if I do audio stuff, it's generally. Uh, Stuff on Rumble, podcast wise, or YouTube podcast replays, that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. like true crime, that kind of stuff. I used to listen to it a lot when I was home alone, running my own company in in Crestone. But now that I'm like out doing my thing for someone else, I don't indulge that much because i realize i'm on someone else's dime so i don't do it as much you know Mm -hmm. so now if you could change four world problems what would those be and why well four of them i wish we didn't have uh kids going to school with uh school lunch debt I think that should be the last thing that kids worry about when they're in school is whether they're going to be able to eat while they're learning. Um, um, I wish we could do away with the prison for profit system and actually focus on the actual, uh, I want to say problems that are landing people in prison instead of just locking them up and leaving them to their own devices, you know, try to offer actual treatment for people instead of going, Hey, well, I know you, you just jacked up again, go sit in a cell and think about it for five years. And when you get out, let's see if you can, let's see if you can make it then, you know, versus 
more than what they offer now. Now it's just a bunch of I'm here and I want to cry about it sessions. That's what I got out of modern day. I don't know what you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Jail system. We're not fixing people. We're not even band-aiding people. We're just telling them to go stand in a corner and think about what you've done. I don't believe that's uh, teaching people a lesson, so to speak. Um, I feel like for number three, we should be able to eradicate pedophilia and pedophiles without anyone's opinion on the matter. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Um, There should be no opposition to that whatsoever. Um, I believe we should protect the kids at all at all costs. And I know that sounds tacky from some people, but every person deserves a childhood and no one deserves to rob that from any child. Um, and that That's just my stance. And a lot of adults, I don't know, man, a lot of adults can't wrap that around their heads. Um, they want to corrupt kids' minds as soon as they are teenagers or not, or not even teenagers before that, like kindergarten and stuff. And I'm like, man, let them be kids, you know, just let them be kids. Once they're 18, you know, they can make up their own minds as to what they want to do until then let them be kids and leave them alone. Um, we can educate them, of course, to give them, you know, I don't, he, we can't we can't give everyone the tools they need, but we can do the best we can, you know. And uh, for number four, um, I don't I don't know what what happened to society, but I don't like I don't even know how to put this, man. It's like well, we've 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 developed into this society to where I don't I don't I, I know living isn't free everyone should do their part do their job but it's like man that's it's just become so expensive just to be a human nowadays I don't I don't understand how we've gotten to this point and how we've gotten to the point where we're a, a human race that's trying to take advantage of each other down to the last dime and I don't have a solution for that. Mm-hmm. I just wish we could fix it and figure it out. Because if 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 everyone's important, man, you know, it doesn't matter if 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 we've got like a million dollars in our bank account or a dollar fifty in our bank account, we all we all get the same vote. We all supposedly all have the same opportunities, but we don't. And because of money and because of what we have to do for money. And it's like, you know, even, even my, my 10 year olds, like, well, who, I mean, like we're on earth, like who, who are we actually paying rent to? Is this just like a contest to see who dies with the most toys in the end? You know, Mm -hmm. because no one, no one gets out of this alive, whatever experiment we may be in or whatever avoid we're living in like sooner or later it ends and it seems like in the capitalistic mind which you know is okay but it's still a little villain-esque because we're just on this earth to see what we can get out of each other monetarily that that walks a little walks a strange line in life to me morally when you think about it you know Yeah, I agree. This here, when you once you die, all the debt you have, the other person will have to repay, which people don't understand. All the debt you're collecting for your like fancy lifestyle, your kids will have to pay it after you pass away. Right, right. Which doesn't go through their brains. It's like, okay, we'll do everything, anything we want. No, no. We're not thinking of the kids and down the line in the future. It's all old. And they don't, you know, it, it, 
it used to be a focus on the kid. I mean, they used to write pop songs about it. Even Whitney Houston wrote a song about the children being our future. They don't even write pop songs about that now anymore, dude. Now it's all about pussy popping and like all kinds of just weird shit. I'm like, okay, that's what we're doing now. All right. <laughs> it's, it's disgusting. <laughs> I'm only in my 30s, but the shit I see is like, I'm born in the wrong damn era. I should have been born in the 80s. and I should be much older. Right. Well, my, you know, all my, my Gen X gearhead buddies were like, man, can we like flag down Marty McFly and go back to the 60s where we would fit in with all like the actual gearheads and stuff? You know, like we feel like dinosaurs. <laughs> So now, in your opinion, why do so many people love to worship celebrities and politicians so much? Because I think it's just too trendy. It's just herd mentality. It's like COVID for celebrities. I think, like, it's all just the the whole... One wanting to blend in. Oh, you like what I like? Let's go, you know, let's all go conform and and act like we all like this thing for the sake of liking it, you know? Every the whole thing, that whole thing you just mentioned reminds you of a cult. Like it's just like a freaking cult. Like yep. to me that's weird because I've done enough research on cults and I don't want to join one. It doesn't matter what kind of No, and that's that's matter. Go ahead. That's how I see, you know, like we had before government, there was religion. Mm -hmm. And then once people didn't want to listen to religion anymore, oh, well, now we have government. It's like, <laughs> so they were just forms mm -hmm. of each other. They're, they're, they're just both forms of control, government and religion. And, you know, and then there's the third, which is pop culture. What do you want to worship? One of the three. That's that's America right there, man. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. It's very crazy. I, I don't understand some of these people like still worshiping Trump even after the shit he's done, both positively and negatively to America. But if you really look deep down and read his what his agendas were in the White House, they were not good. Oh, I know. It, it's crazy. I voted for him in in 2016 because he was like the punk rock anti-Hillary vote. Day. That's the, the only day. reason he got voted. Oh, hold on. Do you have now? Hi. Love you. Love you too. Do you want to do dinner, babe? <laughs> Sorry. No, you're fine, you're fine. Wife's getting ready to head out to dinner. Are you going to join her? Or is this a girl's night? Oh, this is a girl's night. We had Father's Day earlier in Fort Collins. It was nice. Mm -hmm. And my youngest made me a number one dad hat. It was nice. super sweet. Nice, nice. So now tell me about the three most influential people in your life and how they affected you positively or negatively. Ooh. Probably my first one is probably my brother. But it was because he was always my older brother. Like, I'm the youngest of four kids or three kids, two girls and a boy. And I always looked up to my brother. And it was bad because I put him on a pedestal. And as much as I looked up to him, I also allowed him to, like, disappoint me when I shouldn't have because he was my brother and not my dad. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so... That kind of messed up my expectations of what a brother should be, you know, but I i mean, he's my brother, man. What, what can I do? Like family's family. He did his best to look after me, but he's like 10, 10, almost 11 years older than me. And I didn't, I didn't notice that age gap until I had my own kids that were that much older than each other. I'm like, Oh, wow. Now, now I really see what my brother was going through with me. And I I guess I was that annoying little brother who just always wanted his brother's attention, you know. But I don't know. You kind of you 
put family up on a pedestal sometimes too. So, and the number two is probably my mom because she, I mean, she held it together when so many, like so many other moms could have just been like, Oh God, what is this mess? You know, Mm -hmm. but she held it together. She went to work every day. She kept a roof over our head. Um, She instilled like her work ethic unbeknownst to me and to me, just because I was the one who, Saw her go to work every day and watched her sit, complain about paying bills, and smoking cigarettes and watching Oprah and all that stuff. You know, the typical 80s, 90s white single mom crap. <laughs> eating, smoking cigarettes and eating a bit of honeys in the in the Lazy Boy. That was, you know, life with mom at home. But... She was doing the best she could, man, raising three kids. My sister was a freaking nightmare. That's a whole nother story I could go on for hours about. I'll spare you those details. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I thought I was the black sheep. Holy cow. And then three is kind of a wild card because it's my dad. Because he, uh, even though he lost his like mental capacity when I was like four years old, he still stuck around, man, until his number was called. And uh, I didn't think that would mean as much to me as it did. But no matter what he went through, he, he still stuck around to see what life was left, what life was going to throw at him. And he did. So no matter what life throws at you, you know, live it out. See what happens. Don't. Don't take the easy way out. It's not. It's not worth the grief, man. Because I think, I think once we're gone, we hang around and get to see who lives on after we pass. And I don't, I don't think you want to see your friends or family grieving about you for the rest of your life. You know, mm-hmm. like it's bad enough you're gone. Once your number's called, like, don't step out early. Give yourself a chance, you know? (laughs) Mm -hmm. So now I know you're a father. So please define fatherhood in your own words. Um, Being dependable. Being reliable. And uh, sucking it up doing a lot of things you don't want to do like you there's a lot of stuff about being a man a husband a dad that some people don't want to talk about because it's a lot of stuff you don't want to deal with but you got to deal with it such as every day such as what just if you're having a good day and someone else is having a bad day do you want to come home and gloat about your good day or do you want to help the person out who's having a bad day? Like, you know, me, I want to like come home in a good mood and try to get everyone else in a good mood. But I don't want my good mood to trigger someone else's bad mood, you know, that kind of thing. So now what's it like being a father and a husband? Oh man, it's, it's a lot of work being a dad. <laughs> I didn't know how I was going to handle it at first, man. I was like, oh, my God, I'm responsible for a human. And then you you figure it out. I mean, and and it's just like no one's no one's going to figure it out for you. And it's it's a rude awakening and a crash course. Once that baby's here, man, then. It slowly gets easier. You figure it out. Um, I think I think I kind of had an advantage because I didn't know. I grew up without a dad. The closest thing I had to do a dad was my brother. Mm-hmm. And I didn't. All the other stories, the dads I heard about, they were drunks or jerk offs or too controlling over their sons or their daughters or were just were total you know un like didn't trust their kids and that kind of stuff and you know I'm kind of maybe I'm glad I did 
that's out there. I don't know, but mm-hmm. you you learn to set your own rules when you kind of grow up without your own because you're like, I mean, I was a latchkey kid. I my my babysitter was don't answer the door for anyone, you know, basically, you know. Mm-hmm. So now, what's been the most rewarding thing for you as a dad? Oh, watching my oldest graduate high school. And now she's got a full-time job and, and putting herself through getting her pilot's license. Nice. I mean, that's that's it's more motivation than I had at 18, man. I was a teenage dirtbag, bro. Like, they wrote shitty pop songs about us, man. <laughs> that's true, they did. Yeah, like straight up. <laughs> So now, questions to end the episode. What is giving you hope right now? Oh, my kids, my wife. That's it. I mean that. That's it. Mm-hmm. My kids, my wife, and and just watching them grow up and and figure life out and having a partner to do it with, and someone who recognizes me and. Loves me for I am. I mean, loves me for my flaws. Knows I'm not perfect, but still, still right by my side, taking taking life in stride with me. That really means a lot to me, being a kid who like grew up alone. <laughs> so, how did you and your wife meet each other? Um, through a mutual friend. Uh, we were snowboarding at Vail Mountain on Christmas Day in like 2011 December 2011 and uh, the mutual friend couldn't keep up with us so I just ended up hanging out with my wife all day and uh, we were both just kind of broken humans at the time I was like man man she's kind of broken like me I wonder if we could Put each put each other back together and make a life out of it. Mm. And I didn't I didn't stop chasing her until she realized I liked her, and and, and here we are. Like the rest is his, history, man. Mm-hmm. Like I make her a better person, and she makes me a better person. And and I I I don't know if that exists anymore in relationships, bro. Like I feel like. I hit the lottery, man. Like, and we do our best to hold each other, or other like accountable, like for our actions and our feelings. And just, it's good stuff, man. Stuff that I, after I had been through everything I'd been through in life, I never thought I would get a chance like this to do it over again at 2011 and do it. I don't want to say the right way because I'm not perfect, but as right as possible, you know, and we managed and we get, we got married officially June 5th of last year, but we've been together ever since damn, they damn near the day we met Christmas of 2011. So, and I was working up in the mountains. Like I was living like derelict mountain lifestyle, dude. I was working at the ski resort snowboarding 90 days a year like living like the epitome of like the single dude lifestyle and i did it wasn't like it didn't click for me man like i didn't it's it may sound stupid or or like gay to some dudes that are into like their hobbies like i snowboard i mountain bike i did the whole tour of colorado being a guy from the midwest who moved out here but Mm. once i conquered the mountain Working at the ski resort, mountain biking everywhere, snowboarding everywhere. I was still lonely at the end of the day, dude. And I'm just like, what am I going to do? Am I just going to spend the rest of my life with all these sense of accomplishments and still being like a lonely fucking dude at the end of the day? Or am I going to get over my my jadedness and actually let someone back into my life? And that's when I met my wife. And it's like, hey. This this is good. Let's see where this goes, and, and it went. You know. Mm-hmm. So, what do you something you like about her? Uh, 
Well, she's tough. She's a nurse, man. Like, nice. in all honesty, she could probably kick my ass. I mean, I'm like 6'4", 200 pounds, but she could probably hip hip check me like a hockey player into the boards, man. <laughs> She's tough. She's a tough chick, and she doesn't even realize how tough she is, man. So now, what are three podcasts you recommend to my listeners and why? Um, well, I recommend yours because it's really a broad array of guests and speakers and experiences. Um, I recommend Nightwave because it's basically just a derelict tard fest about four nights a week. Like if you want to get your dose of what's really going on, tune into a few episodes of Nightwave on Rumble. Um, my favorite is uh, basically what brought me out of like my my black hole. Like I lived in a black hole in Crestone for five years. Um, the first person who got me back into even tweeting on Twitter, who was a stranger to me at the time, was Horace Mommy. Like, I know, like, I've never met her in person, but we're good internet friends, which mm. is funny. Same with, you know, sibling revelry. Those guys are real good internet friends. Never met them in real life. But, like, like I love these guys, man. They, they brought me out of my hole. Like, my, like, I've never been into the like i tried a youtube channel maybe back in like 2007 and 2008 and was talking about some of my traumatic stuff and was literally harassed off of youtube over it and got all kinds of like nasty messages from people in my hometown of brian how dare i talk about what happened to me in the 90s and 80s and all this stuff i'm just a loser who can't shut up about what happened to him in life like that's i got a lot of that i'm just like oh wow your parents are sure proud of you aren't they you know <laughs> that's crazy people yeah dude people people show you their bad side if you let them mm -hmm. it's really crazy but this coming is why out you of your ground and like ignore it yeah i do so i i used to get sucked in by the trolls on twitter but i've i don't do that anymore and lastly where can people find you online um uh, well i'm on twitter um i'm at hogdog303 and then instagram i believe i'm at hogdog970 let me look at a few of my tags here oh here's my phone but yeah, it's mainly just, uh, oh, I think I'm on YouTube too as uh, at hogdog970, but mainly all my tags are hogdog. Okay. If you guys can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all over social media at Hockey Podcast. You can watch all my interviews on my YouTube channel at Hockey Podcast. Everything else related to me, you can find it on my link tree as always. That's in the show notes. Thank you so much, Hog Dog, for coming on the show today. Right on, man. Thanks for having me. Sorry if I came off a little nervous.